question is, are you ready? You do know in the last survey that the church did for that specific question, if Jesus will come today, do you see yourselves saved? Only 40% said yes. That's a question that we have to ask ourselves every day. Jesus comes today. Are you ready? The third angel of the six, we have stated, is the one with a solemn message. The third angel we have discovered raised the light to key players in the final battle between good and evil. The players on the losing side are the devil, his angels, and his false form of religion and those who adhere to it. The players on the winning side are the Godhead, the unfallen angels, and true religion and those who adhere to it. The third angel forces us to pause and identify the false side. The dragon is the devil, according to Revelation 12 and verse 9. The beast is the form of false Christianity which developed in the period between pagan Rome and the beginning of the United States of America, according to Daniel 7 and Revelation 13. We have discovered that this religious power asserts the right to alter God's law and the right to forgive sins of what the Bible calls blasphemy. That is found in Daniel 7.25 and 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 3 and 4. The image of the beast is other religious religions that support the essential marks that the beast power uh, makes uh, it says that they are the voice of God on earth according to Revelation 13 verse 11 through 17 and Revelation 16 verses 13 and 14 and it is an attempt to force religion via legislation via what? we point that out already we are not going to get into the details about the mark of the beast as another Bible study that we're going to go into, um, except to say that we have learned in the many Bible prophecy seminars that the mark of the beast is an attempt to substitute the real Sabbath for a false one. Now, you have to remember that the first angel set the stage. The first angel says the stage of the first three angels' messages by raising the issue to fear God. Remember that? Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And we have said throughout this part of the basic training series that the theme of the first three angels, of the six angels, is to put God in his rightful place as creator and redeemer. I'll say amen for you. Amen. Thank you, Monica. But by the time we arrive at the words of the third angel, the scene is set. Those who heed the call to enthrone God in their life and stand on the Lord's side, and those who knowingly reject the call to place tradition, and place tradition, excuse me, and error above the word of God. But then there are those who will inherit those people who actually do that will inherit the displeasures of God. The Bible phrase for this displeasure is manifested in Revelation 14 and verse 10, where it says, The wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. That leads me to the, today's you know, title. A special message. The wrath of God, a message that was inspired by one of our youth. Asking the question, you're talking about these three angels, but I'm always concerned about this wrath of God. 
the wrath of God. Let's pray. Father, speak. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. To be honest with you, when I sent the mass text last night, I wasn't expecting a lot of you here at church. Because this is a strange subject. And a lot of people tend to stay home for subjects like this one. Now, this is the second, this is what's going to be the last message, but no, the youth had to come up with something, right? So this is the second to last sermon for this portion of the series about the six angels of Revelation 14. But what many people do not realize is that the subject, this subject is one of the most serious subjects for any Christian to understand. And I'm going to start the sermon with a series of questions. Questions posed by your youth people, by your young people. Have you ever felt that God was mad at you? Have you? Have you ever felt that you were being directly punished by God? Questions? I guess I'm the only one who ever felt that way, huh? Have you ever felt that God was dealing with you directly because of some sin that you have committed? Uh, have you ever felt, had that feeling? I would venture to suggest that most adults who take a, you know, a, a religious view of life had these questions in their mind at some time in their existence. These feelings often come as a result of our own deep sense of guilt. We tend to feel at times that, that if God isn't angry with me, he ought to be. Come on, somebody. Get off your pious couch. We all have been there. And if, if you have ever had such feelings, you know that such feelings are not comfortable. Let me begin by saying straight out that no one in this room or no one watching right now has experienced. Let me say that again. No one. No one. Did I say no one? No one in this room and watching at home has ever experienced the wrath of God described in Revelation 14.10. All through Scripture... From the very beginning, the wrath, the anger of God is, is always in the Bible, cushion. That's right. cushion. What, what word did I say? Cushion. Come on, folks, get, get into it. Cushion. In fact, when you read the Bible with a discerning eye, it, it becomes increasingly evident that God's wrath is not the kind of blind, vindictive emotion that so often possesses human beings. But rather, listen to me because I'm just getting to the main point of the sermon. God's wrath is really a method, not an emotion. <laughs> yeah, let, me just, let me just sit back here and let me make sure that you get this one. God's wrath is a method of responding to error. A method calculated to appeal and then heal the error. What do I mean? Well... Let's look at some biblical examples, shall we? Take man's first sin. A, 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 in fact, turn, turn, turn with me a, you know, in your Bible to so Genesis chapter 3. Come on. You brought it, use it. Genesis 3, a, 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 in verses, verses 1 through 15. Genesis 3, verses 1 through 15. It, it unfolds the agonizing story of the first senseless sin that man committed. Completely senseless. And the key verse of Genesis 3 is verse 15. We call it the garden promise. Where God, having addressed them after their error, announces, I will put enmity. I will put enmity. Then having announced the results of disobedience, God immediately cushions the blow with a promise of awareness. By the way, that's, that's what enmity is. 
He, 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 he cushions the blow with, with the promise of awareness and the promise of a savior. So God's first manifestation of displeasure towards human beings is cushion. Take, for example, the sins of the antediluvians. Keep turning in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, come on, you're there with me, right? This time, it is in verses 1 through 13, the Bible expresses the agony of God, that the thoughts of men have become evil continually. And the situation of moral decay and rebellion that erupted before the flood again brought forth the displeasure of God. But in verse 14 of Genesis 6, there is the cushion. Noah is instructed to prepare a way of escape by saying, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark. This, is, this also appears in actually verse 3 of the same chapter where God says, You got 120 years to get yourself together. He's upset, but there's a cushion. And you can trace this pattern in the Bible over and over again. God is displeased. And in some cases, God even pronounces his judgment. But the declaration of God's implementation of this pleasure is always cushion. For example, when Abraham lies about his relationship with Sarah and this place, uh, this trust in God's ability to, 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 to look out after Abraham, there's no question that God is upset. God announces his disfavor in the words of a heathen king in Genesis 12, verses 18 and 19. And then in verse 20, there's the cushion. All right? It, it, it says, read, And Pharaoh commanded his man concerning him, Abraham, and they sent them away, and his wife, and all that he had. In spite of his sin, listen, in spite of his sin, Abraham was sent away with all that he had. Not to mention that God plagued the home of the Pharaoh. You lied, I'm upset, but go safely. Is anybody awake in this place today? You see, I began by making the statement that no one, I said no one, has ever experienced the wrath of God as described in Revelation 14.10. Because throughout the Bible, God's wrath is always cushion. <laughs> when Moses gets hasty to deliver his oppressed people his own way and takes us a staff of human anger to assail an Egyptian who was found beating up a Hebrew, he was discovered, right? He was exiled to the wilderness, and then comes the cushion. See, God uses the wilderness to prepare Moses for the greatest accomplishment of his life. I said that God's anger is a method, not an emotion. You see, a lot of people, when they get upset, they stop thinking. When God gets upset, he thinks even deeper. God gets angry, God gets upset, but God never loses his temper. Oh, somebody ought to say Amen. Over and over again in the holy record, God's displeasure with his people is announced and his wrath is kindled and then the cushion. But the best example of this is the entire book of Judges. <laughs> uh, now I just forgot completely about you and I'm just going to enjoy this all by myself. Uh, Judges 3. Judges chapter 3. Yeah, verses 7 through 9. All right, are you there? I don't hear no Bibles turning. <laughs> Judges 3. <laughs> just, just turn your phone, something. Judges 3, verses, verses 7 through 9. Are you there? Let's read. And the children of Israel did what? Evil, Evil in the sight of the Lord, and forgot the Lord their God, and served Balaam and the groves. Verse 8, here we go. Therefore, what? The what? God is mad. The anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand 
of the what? Come on now. Come on. Read it. Cush and Rasathium. Come on. <laughs> I knew I was going to get you on that one. Right? For how many years? Eight years. Keep reading. I'm going to get you out of that. Here we go. And when the children of Israel did what? Cried out unto the Lord. The Lord, Lord raised up a what? A deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them. Even what? Othniel, the son of Canaan, Caleb's younger brother. Is that a cushion or what? God lets them feel it. But the Bible says that they cried out to the Lord. And the Lord said a cushion. Look, look at the same chapter. Look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. This, this is going to get better. It says, and the children of Israel did evil. When? When? Again. Right? In the sight of the Lord. And the Lord what? Strengthened Eglon and then the king of Moab against Israel. Because they had done evil in the what? In the sight of the Lord. Look at verse 13. And he gathered up the children of Ammon and Amalek and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. So the children of Israel served what? Eglon, the king of Moab, how many years? I mean, you will think that after eight and now 18, they'll get it. Nope. No. Does anybody know what I'm talking about here? Verse 15, here we go. But when the children of Israel, what? Cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a what? How can you read that so sublimely? There it is, again. Did evil? God is upset, but they did what? Cry. They did what? Come on, have you been there? They did what? And the Lord said, a cushion. Judges 4. Judges 4, starting in verse 1. Ready? Here we go. Just one page. Here we go. And this one is 20 years of oppression, by the way. <laughs> it says this. And the children of Israel, again, did evil in the sight of God when, when Ehud was dead. You know, Ninette is the one that got me hooked up in this book of Judges a long time ago. Because if you ever want to love the Lord, read Judges. Sixteen times the children of Israel messed up. The Bible re records exactly what they did. And it always used the word again. Because it is always again. And they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And then they cried unto the Lord. And God heard their cry and sent deliverance. Somebody ought to be giving God a good amen right now. All right, you can just sit there on your pious horse. Because it seems to me that somebody today is still living in the book of Judges. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. You know the God who hears your cry after you've done it again. And again, and again, and he keeps on sending the cushion. Go to Judges chapter 6. I'm just getting warmed up. Judges 6. <laughs> you ready? Verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the... You, you, you ought to memorize that one already. Yeah. Yeah. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. Do you see what I'm trying to say in the first part of the sermon? God's wrath is a method, not just an emotion. He's seeking. How do I get through to Mario? How am I going to reach out to Keegan? How do I get through to Reggie? I want them to know that I'm upset, but I'm re what I'm really after is not just punishment, but permeation. I'm trying to get through to them. Judges 10, this is a very interesting chapter. <laughs> because in this chapter, there was given a list of judges that will rule Israel and that God used to bring deliverance. And in verse, in verse 6 through 16 of Judges 10, uh, um, you know, let's read this because this is, this is powerful. Judges 10, 
verse, uh, verse 6 to 16. This is what it, in verse 6 it says. It says, and the children of, <laughs> Lord have mercy. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and, ser and served Balaam and Astaroth and the gods of Syria and the gods with little g of Sidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the children of Ammon and the gods of the Philistines and they forsook the Lord and served not him. Now this is chapter 10. And you will think, and friends, I want this sermon to get through to you this morning. You know, you're going to leave this sermon loving the Lord as you never have loved them before. Look at the list of gods they are serving now. Not just one. You know, we just go everywhere and just serve all the gods that we can find. In spite of the goodness and the mercy and the patience of God, you see, one of the things that you must understand is that sin not overcome multiplies. <laughs> Let me say that again. Sin not overcome multiplies. Sin not overcome does not get better. Sin not overcome gets worse. Now, you have this whole list of gods with little g's. Go to verse 10. Verse 10, it says, and the children of Israel, you, you can probably say this by, by memory now, right? Yeah. And the children of Israel did what? Evil. Yeah, and the children of Israel, what? Cried unto the Lord, saying, we have sinned against thee, the. Hey, hey, hey. hey yo, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. Look at verse 11. And the Lord said, and the Lord said, Unto the children of Israel, did not I deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines? Now look at verse 13. Yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods, huh? wherefore I will deliver you no more. Look at verse 14. It gets better. Go cry unto the gods which you have chosen. Hold oh, no, 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 no. You're reading the Bible too fast. God says, okay, cool, right? Give me one second here. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put it out there. Go talk to Balaam. Go wake up Astaroth. See if you can wake up Moab. Are you hearing him? Yeah, yeah. But even Saying that, if you keep reading, the Lord delivers them and sends a cushion. You see, the words of his anger are not spiteful. He's trying to make you think. Why are you talking to me, says the Lord? He's not being spiteful. He just wants you to think. If I am the one that can help you, then why are you worshiping these other gods? If your bank account cannot save you, why you put that in front of me? If that degree won't get you to heaven, why is that in front of me? If that relationship is getting you out of the church. You see it now? You see... What we have here is not an unfocused tirade or rant by some capricious deity. As Satan has actually taught, uh, you know, the heathen to believe about God. You know, when, 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 what we have here is God trying to get your attention. See, God is calling out, reaching towards us. I, I, and, and to do this, God uses two, how many? Two methods. Direct intervention and inevitable consequences. Now, let me, just, let me just keep this straight. By direct intervention, we mean, as in the case of the flood, that God moves and causes something that happened that otherwise would not happen unless God, is, God did it. The hand of God is inserting into the flow of human events, and God's displeasure is manifested. 
This is the first way that God gets our attention and shows his wrath. But the first method is not the one most frequently used by God. More often, God does it, does it, uh, does, is, is divert to the second method, inevitable consequences. Say it. Inevitable what? One example in this case is Solomon and all these women with whom he got involved with. The fact that he ultimately lost his health and vitality and spirituality was not direct intervention of God, but it was the natural consequences of self-abuse. Ignoring the laws of nature and associating so closely with non-believers that he, Solomon, lost his sense of right and wrong. God just allowed to happen what he already said in his word, and he said to Solomon, it would happen if such activities were practiced. You see, you have been doing that for a long, long time. But sooner or later, you get tired and the facts of life catch up to you and your stubbornness and, and, and willfulness. Many of us here and watching right now confuse consequences with punishment. You see, often it is not God dealing with you directly. It is just God leaving you to deal with yourself. Such results are not punishment in, in, in themselves, but the punishment, the punishment, the punishment is having to live with your own stupidity. I, I'm witness to that. Oh, I'm a witness to that. Having to deal, to find yourself any respect left for yourself. So disgusted with yourself that you don't want to even see yourself in the mirror. That's punishment. But it's not God. It is just self-punishment. But whether we have seen the direct hand of God or whether we have experienced sin since atomic fallout, it is always cushion. <laughs> See, God, as he did with Nebuchadnezzar, when he, he stole his, this man's mind, leaves something yet to work with. Oh, come on, friends. Like he did with Moses, who was not allowed to enter into the earthly promised land. He was resurrected and taken to the heavenly promised land. As he did with John the Baptist. No intervention, but the peace of knowing before he died that Jesus really was the Christ. Think about it, friends. Today, reflect on the cushions of God in your life. You see, heathen religions are based on false understandings of God. Heathen religions paint God as moody, ill-tempered creature who must be appeased and placated to keep him from knocking us around. So if something goes wrong, if the crops fail or sickness strikes, the fear, the fearful go running to perform religious rites in order to make God happy. See, too many times so-called Christians make this same mistake. When the wrong falls on you as a direct result of your foolishness, we go running to church. We want to get reconsecrated. Oh, we start running, uh, you know, we start returning tithe again, not having given God a dime for five years. Suddenly we start going to prayer meeting. Or we start joining the ministries. We have this hedonistic concept of God. We feel that he's upset, so we have to do something to calm God down. The fact is that most of these cases, rather than God being in our case, he's just allowed the natural consequences of an inconsistent, rebellious life to catch up with us. Rather, he has not intervened to keep the natural results of defying the laws of God. See, we insult God with this kind of sporadic outburst of religious fervor. See, God doesn't want a desire, for, you know, for his appeasement. Like, like, like he's some kind of old man that didn't get his way. 
God does not want appeasement. God wants appreciation. We cannot buy off God with religiosity. He wants a relationship. You get in trouble, you start running to church. You get in trouble, then you ask, oh, you got to start praying right now. Get up that stuff which insults God. He's trying to get to your mind. God doesn't want some coins out of your pocket or how many prayers you prayed. He wants your soul, your mind, everything that you are. His anger is a method, not an emotion. You know, there are times when he does not intervene directly. But as, as it is always an act of love, not simply an act of punishment. But in the book of James, in discussing temptation, he says in the first chapter and verse 13, that God cannot be tempted with evil. You know, I believe that the same principles applies here when it comes to God's reaction to our evil. For God to be spiteful when we do wrong, I repeat, God's wrath is a method, not a reaction or an emotion. It is focused, listen to me, it is focused and intended to be productive and redemptive. See, God does, just doesn't get mad. God gets busy. <laughs> You're not getting it today. You are not awake today. Look, God woke me up at 3.30, change that stuff. God does not just get mad. He gets busy. But why does God operate this way? It's important to know that God's wrath is always preceded by God's warnings. See, all, people always talk to me about the flood and why did God do that. They never take into consideration that there were 120 years of preaching that they could hear. In all the situations that we have discussed in the sermon so far, whether we're talking about a, 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 in the person of Adam and Eve or Abraham or the last sin just committed on the last second, God has provided information. It is God's practice of warning us ahead uh, that, that justifies his wrath. It's the same way that we deal with our children. I, that's right. I told you. That if you did so and so and so and so. Now, if you had a mother like mine, my mother was a keeper of promises. And, and if she caught you messing around at church, I was a Catholic back then. At church, she caught that eyebrow, and the eyebrow said, after church. It was at that moment that Mario started praying that the, that the priest would take longer in his dissertation. Because after church, promises will be kept. Why? She felt justified. Because she told me, the minute I got out of the house, don't, stop, don't start messing at church. God's warnings justify his wrath. He prepared Adam and Eve, and they still fail. But in the book of Deuteronomy, for instance, you got 15 verses in chapter 28 where God takes time to state the blessings that will come for a loving obedience to him. But then that is followed by 52 verses of warnings, details of the consequence of stubborn, willful disobedience. 52! And then it's followed by 10 more verses leading to chapter 29, reminding them of God's goodness and urging them, since you know how God has blessed you, and now you have been warned of the results of ignoring God's instruction, please be obedient. This is why God operates the way that he does. Either to directly intervene with judgment or just allow the consequences of our acts to reach and teach us. But whatever it is, whatever it is, is always cushioned. <laughs> I don't know if you're awake, but I'm just going to enjoy this all by myself. You know, David understood this, Keegan, you and I. Let's, 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 I'm just going to preach to you. 
You recall the situation in the Bible where David, in pride, wanted to know the power of his people and the, his potential military might, mustered and, and numbered uh, Israel? Strange. It's hard to explain. It's found in, in 2 Samuel chapter 24. David comes to realize that he did wrong and he repents in verse 10. God then sends the prophet Gad to talk to David to deliver God's message. David is given, listen, David is given three choices of punishment from God. Are you with me? Oh, yeah, just two of you. Are you with me? Yeah. One involves his enemies. And two of them involves the intervening methods of famines and pestilences. And after hearing the choices, Lord have mercy. This is David's response in 2 Samuel 24, 14. I am in great strait. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. And let me not fall in the hand of man. Come on, somebody. David said, who have been dealt by, who have been dealt by, by God before, right? When the deal goes down, I'd rather have God deal with me and his cushions than all of you at church who have no cushion. <laughs> no cushion. So for many of us, our experiences with God have not left us uh, with the faith of David. He had this, this statement of trust. He was a man who had not become skittish or resentful or of God's dealings and complainings or afraid of God. No, 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 no. David believed that God would be fair. Do you believe that? You see, sometimes God can be rough. But brethren, I know about the cushion. I would not be standing here in front of you preaching to you as your pastor if God did not believe in cushioning. You see, when the deal goes down, leave me in the hands of the Almighty God. We need to learn that. We need to let that become active in our lives. If somebody is going to deal with me, let it be somebody who knows me inside and out. And yet, as he knows me, he prostrated himself on Calvary's cross that I might be redeemed. I put myself in his hands every day. My friends, only one human being thus far have ever experienced Revelation 14.10. Drinking the cup of God's wrath, which is poured out without mixture. What was the wrath supposed to be mixed with, Mario? The cushion. Mercy. Only one human being was ex had experienced God's wrath unmixed with mercy. Only one human being knows about that. And I can hear him. It's heartbreaking. The shattering cry bouncing off the sound waves of heaven and earth. A cry that can only be uttered by a mouth speaking from a heart that bore every single lie. That carry every curse word ever spoken. A heart that bore the curse of every rage and every act of immorality. Not only was all the murders heaped on his shoulders, but all of the hate and malice and every greed and insanity behind every murder was heaped on him. The sin of every hurting word ever spoken in anger. The sin of every jealous thought. You see, Jesus even bore the sin of every wasted moment. Every hour spent working on Sabbath and talking about secular things on his holy time. Or just staying at home on Sabbath to watch the football game. All this was heaped on him on the cross. The lies of gossip pass over the phone as people air somebody else's dirty, dirty laundry. Jesus felt that. 
I mean, it could have been enough for the weight of his own body to fear the, the, the you know, to, to actually tear, sorry, uh, uh, the holes in his hands where the spikes have been driven. For he was a big man, 6'3", six, 6'4", six, frame that had been developed in his youth by helping his father chop down trees to make furniture. In his days, a carpenter was first a lumberjack, then a builder. I say his weight by itself was too much for the tender tissues of his hands to support. But now God have laid on him the iniquities of us all. In his wounds, the tithe that I misspent was paid. The stripes on his back and the pieces of missing flesh for the skipping of church or failing to study and oh, me skipping the prayer time is paid at the cross. So that finally, finally, for the first time, a human being feels the absence of God. It's as if God died and no longer could love. Finally, for the first time, a human being feels the cold sweat of God's total rejection. He becomes the chief of sinners. He is the stench of the universe. And so finally, it erupts in him a shattering cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Wrath. Put out with a mixture with mercy. It's not a sponge of vinegar, but a cup dipped on the other side of God's being. No sugar in the cup, no cushion on the cross. Somebody has to really feel it. Somebody has to really feel the total wrath of God against sin. And the one who does it is a total innocent man. The ultimate wrath of God is not fire, it's not brimstone. The ultimate wrath of God is wrath unmixed with mercy. The ultimate wrath of God is not some physical punishment, it is eternal separation from God. Don't insult God saying that fire is the punishment of sin. The ultimate punishment of sin is separation from the Savior. No more cushion, not for Jesus. No more cushion for my Jesus. And so in Revelation 14, 10, cries out, uh, 14, 11, and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. The word translated for forever and ever is in the text means as long as it lasts. It does not mean billions or trillions of years in hell. Let me give you an example. The Bible says that Jonah was in the belly of the whale forever, right? But we know that he was there three days and three nights. There will not be a forever burning hell. That's not wrath or mixed with mercy. The wrath is eternal separation from the source of life. And the tra tragedy of hell, the tragedy of burning hell, the lake of fire described in Revelation 20. The sadness of that place is that the price has been paid. You see, Jesus died the death of those that will not be saved. Because the Bible says that the lake of fire is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the, back, in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the tragedy of the burning hell is that people that are paying, that are there, are paying a price that was already paid for them. Why should the price be paid twice? That's why, Sister Mac, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left its crimson stain, but Jesus wipes it white as snow. The wrath of God for Mario Torres is supported by a cushion. 
The rest of God for you is supported by a cushion. Why fool around until God removes the cushion? In preparation for this sermon. Yeah, let's finish, Sister Mac. I can't take it any longer. It's too much for me. In preparation for the sermon, and because of the week that I had at work, I went back to reading Steps to Christ and the book Great Controversy. It talks about how God will wipe away all tears from our eyes. Because looking through the, through the gates and the crystal walls, we, we, will, we will see those that will not be saved. You see, the new Jerusalem comes down from God out of heaven. I, and in Revelation 20, it says that the wicked will encircle or surround the city. We're going to see people that we know outside. So, so God spares us. He wipes away all tears. But then the book points out that because God cannot forget, he will tarry in his heart for eternity the memory of every sinner that he could not save. For us, eternal cushion, a mind that cannot remember, but my God, my God, my loving and precious God bears in his heart the, 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 the visitor that would not make a decision. The member who just sat there, Sabbath after Sabbath, allowed heaven to pass over him or her when the appeal was made. God cannot forget you. So I offer you today a cushion. You don't have to die because Jesus paid it all. I said Jesus paid it all. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. This morning, my Jesus woke me up early to tell me it is time to open that watery grave of baptism once again. The weather is getting nice and people are looking for me. So we need to allow them the opportunity to make a decision for me, Mario. So in June, we're going to baptize again. And I know some of you have expressed your desire to be baptized and to be part of that harvest. But where did you stand? Will you accept the cushion of God today? His grace? So I'm offering you today a savior. His church. His word. A new lifestyle. A new beginning spelled out clearly through exaltation and mourning in his word, the Bible. And if you would accept Christ today and his church and his word, or you have already accepted Christ, but as you visited this church, you know that there's more in his will and his word, and you want to add that to your life. Or you need to make that first start with Jesus Christ. If that is you, why don't you just get up right now? And accept the cushion of God in your life. To start over. Say, Lord, I'm here. You want to start over? Yes, you want to be baptized. Yes, you want a new beginning in your life. And you know you need to make that decision. If that is you, stand up right now. And come to where I am. So we may seal your decision in heaven today. Who wants the cushion of a loving God? Come on. Just come. Whoever you are. Yeah. Whoever you are, come. Come. Jesus says that little children will actually answer first. Here comes my older angel. Join us, 
was right here. Anybody else that want to start or restart, you know you need a cushion today. Anybody else? Anybody else? Praise the Lord. <laughs> Dependency in Jesus. <laughs> That's, this is the way we have to be like little children. Depending on Christ for everything. Anybody else that want to take this call and answer Jesus' call for your life today? You want to be baptized? You want to be rebaptized? This is your moment. Anybody else? Anybody else? For the rest of you, please stand. Let's pray about these precious souls. These precious souls. Maybe I should ask this question. Anybody like me this week need the cushion of God? Just raise your hand. That's right. You may put it down. Lord, you saw our hands. We need your cushion. Things are rough. Maybe we have family problems, financial problems. Well, Lord, you have for every, everything that is happening to us, you have given us a cushion. Mercy. So, Lord, whatever we're going through right now, can you please cushion even more? Just a little bit more, Lord. But Father, heaven is rejoicing this morning because even little children hear your word and they answer. So right now, Lord, these souls want to prepare themselves to be baptized, to start their journey. So right now, Father, I'm asking you to seal their decisions in heaven. We will get them ready. They'll know why they're doing what they're doing. So Jesus, help us as a church to continue to guide them to the kingdom of heaven. And Lord, as I always ask, if you decide to show up tonight, <laughs> I just ask that you find every single one of us worthy to be in your presence. To always look up and say, this is him. This is our God. Oh, Lord, we have waited for you. Because we know that you're the only one that can save us. Find us worthy to say those words. Not running, but to stay there and go to heaven together. Thank you, Jesus, for today, what you have done. And thank you for what you continue to do. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen, amen and Amen. You may be seated.